So what I wanted to talk about today is uh, my technique of gathering information. And I, I, I have bait, so I'm using bait for people. So imagine a funnel. And what I do is I, uh, with my historical society, which we work in the northeast corner of Connecticut together, Woodstock and uh, Putnam and others. And what we're trying to do is this funnel, I put out newsletters, books and things, and we want people to go out and bring information to us. So this is about things that are arriving in my email, things that come in to me, people who hand me photographs. My main interest is in text, historic text, old maps, but I will gladly take an old photograph if I can get it. So um, when we put out the very first of these presentations, this, these are now going back a long time. So if uh, Myra Pearson, Malcolm Pearson, and Jane Johnson, for those of you very old timer uh, folks, you might really recognize some of these. This is the Tamler Carnfield in uh, Thompson, Connecticut, part of the Wyndham Land Trust. And the Carns are very tall and very tapered. This information flows to me. So what we do is, our team is, we're making presentations, we're going out to all the local historical societies with the intent of sending me stuff. It's a very selfish motive, folks. Okay, I am really, really selfish. I'll give you something and you give me something back, okay? So um, Jim Whittall has been mentioned numerous times. This is the Thompson uh, sweat hut dated 800 years ago from right about now. This is one of those. I'd love to see uh, retested at some point. And the Johnsons were the ones who were feeding me information and bringing me people who could give uh, other things. So for example, I wanted translations of certain things. I wanted evidence of sweat huts. So this is the Roger Williams 1643 explaining what a sweat hut is. And uh, I, I like the text. I'm looking for text. So I like where they're talking about the stories of them sitting in there, taking tobacco, discoursing, sweating together. And this is where they mention in here that they re helps them recover from the French disease, right? 1643, it's pretty cool. Um, another find from the Micmac is 1672. Um, again, what I like is I'm reading down here, they remained there as long as they could and they stuck to it for an hour and a half or two hours. They chanted songs and told stories to make themselves laugh. And when I'm giving my presentations, it's very funny to me to think about them sitting there cracking jokes, uh, let, you know, yucking it up in the middle of this sweating session. It's just fun. I just, it just, Somehow it, it appeals to me, makes them much more human. And certainly my audiences, when I'm training them, and I have four classes, class one, two, three, and four. Class one is my intro to these lithic topics. But I just try to make it really personable, human. These are humans from a long time ago. And so uh, what I do in these classes to drag info to me is I ask them to use their zoomorphic mindset to try to figure out what, what is it that you're actually seeing? So this is about education and training. And so what will happen is someone will send me one. This is one that they found and sent to me and said, yeah, that's a, that's a turtle on sitting on top of a gray turtle, right? Something like that. I love, I love how many I get. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds per year come in of texts or photos, things like this. Um, for those of you familiar with David Wagner, uh, the remnants of Weir on the Quinnebog River in our northeastern corner of Connecticut. Um, uh, again, it helps to bring people to understand how these things are constructed. And I don't, I, David Wagner and I have gone on a number of um, walks together. He's made presentations with our group. He used to live in Thompson, Connecticut, for those who don't know how we were connected with David. But his art is beautiful. I'm not saying it was done this way, but that's what, how he pictured it. And he did quite a bit of research. Um, he's also uh, uh, collecting his work is one of my things, trying to pull 
together David Wagner's art. And I'd like to do that. But how those weirs uh, were, were actually used in smoking the shad, this gives you an idea. And it's really good when helping to train, especially the junior folks who uh, I specialize on. I, I give tours to young people on these sites, go out to corn fields and also bring them to, to the sweat huts and things like that. Uh, one that I find particularly fun, uh, if you're familiar with this, the history of future of Narragansett Bay, they talk about this prehistoric big dig, the Boylston Street Weir dated to 2500 BC and was a prehistoric big dig, I like that one. 65,000 logs driven into the mud of the river to form that weir. That's pretty, pretty impressive. Now, I'm not expecting you to see any of this. All I want you to understand is, again, I'm looking for old documents. So this 1883 Woodstock map, John Lester map, if I zoom in in a couple of areas, which I'm going to do, I'm going to, there's dozens of spots on here of interest. Uh, there's a, a hill here, Fort Hill is listed. There is a, uh, a block house from the very earliest, when it was a pioneer period, they put a block house uh, when it was first settled. Um, they wanted to abandon the fort and go back to near Boston. And they were uh, said, nope, you, you got to stay in the block house. We'll build you a better block house to encourage you to stay. But anyway, I'm going to zoom in. And uh, you'll see in the map an Indian burying ground. You'll come down here to Crystal Pond, and you'll say Indian graves. And as I said, there's numerous. Uh, sites on this example of a map, and we have many maps. Now, if you look closely at the Hatchet Pond area, you look, it's hard, you can't see it, but Indian graves, houses, Indian graves and houses, the quantity of these uh, are just spectacular. And again, this is what I am looking like when I'm training. Now, the particular talk here, I'm just using little snippets of information that was brought to me and I'm just passing it along to you. Um, when we, there's this migration, when the Mohawk pressure and, the, and that region was pushing on, we had the Pequots and the Mohegans pushing down into this area, there was an impact. And so we see f forts and stonework. We already know about this New Hampshire example. But I want you to look closely at this uh, pathway here. You look, every, this pathway has a defensive, a defensive fort. So we have in the northeastern part of Connecticut the great eel story, the Narragansetts against the Nipmucks, the eel story, and they had defensive carns. So carns were, it, you know, everybody knows the story where you don't want a wolf to dig up dead grandma, right? So you throw rocks on it to keep the wolf from ripping the, the, bear, the, the smell would attract the wolf. So that was one carn purpose. Another carn is a memorial carn. But there's defensive carns. And this is evidence of a defensive carn. I'm sure we all know that too. We, uh, moving on to forts, northeastern Connecticut and th that southern mass area, we're right above that between Worcester and Thompson, Connecticut, had five, uh, five forts five known forts. So I'm just giving you an example of one type of fort. Um, and I was particularly attracted to the forts when, uh, when I was a young kid. There was a call for help over at the Institute of Native American Studies in Washington, Connecticut. And, the, and so here I am, 15 years old, me and a couple other young kids. We thought we we're going, we're, we're going to go look for arrowheads and something. And they brought us over there. And it was still important that I learned. That's where I learned as, as a young kid. Uh, I am from uh, the Nanticoke side uh, from Maryland. So I had a, good, a very good appreciation of what this meant. Well, this palisade fence and these structures, uh, well known. This is from the Pequot Museum. Again, you can see the palisade, palisade fence there. Um, so now. I come to Thompson, and again, a story is brought to me that Fort Hill actually really had a fort on it. So again, uh, this is the map of 
from 1749 to Fort Hill and Thompson. And next thing you know, here is the line of the map. You bring it out, and there is the word Old Fort on it, 1749. Okay. And there it sat. For 25 years, nobody knows a single thing more about it. Not a thing. And then something shows up. A single photograph. This is the first time I've ever shown this photograph to anyone from the NERA organization. And that is the only known photo that I am aware of of what the fort was. This is from about 1910. And I'll read what it says. The fort of which the site is shown was where the Indians of the region held off the settlers when they pressed them too hard. Standing here, one can see and yet not be seen as the head hardly cuts the skyline. Okay, so there it is. Now, Fort Hill became very famous. Uh, the historian Ellen Larned said it was the best known Indian relic of all of Wyndham County in Connecticut. And a pavilion was built on Fort Hill directly over the fort by a man who was a partner of Thomas Edison and was the first one who installed electricity in Chicago, blah, blah, blah. His name was John Doan, but he was the one who funded this at the top of Fort Hill in Thompson. I want you to just look at the trees here. Look at the, the it was an alley lane that was planted at great expense to get up that hill. Now I'm going to show you. Look at the size of the trees now, much uh, maybe 10 years later. And so this is the same woman who had this scrapbook, and it says, the drive. Mr. Doan put in a drive which ended at the fort. He kept the flag there. Now two odd-shaped trees mark the site. The pit has been filled with stones. After the first attempt to settle, the two farms some time passed, and when the settlers came, all lines were lost. Near this fort on a tree, a mark was found from which the line was placed. And we're talking about the line for Major, Tom Major Thompson's farm. So that's what they're talking about. The, the line, this fort sat on the line, as I showed you before. So we know by about 1910 that the fort had been filled in. Now, what's interesting is 10 miles down the road in Danielson, Connecticut, there is another hill that has a fort. Now, Ellen Larned always called this a cellar, an aboriginal cellar. Well, in Danielson, Connecticut, at the top of a hill, they call it a water well at the top of the hill, and somebody call it a water cellar. Okay, that's that. So anyway a find that comes in. Somebody just walked in the door of my museum and showed us this book. So this is how it shows up. All right, switching to another story completely. In northeastern Connecticut, there was a group called the Glenn Dash Foundation. Some of you may know Glenn Dash, uh, Dash, Strauss, and Goodhue. Uh, when I worked at Digital Equipment, uh, now Hewlett Packard, he started a great testing firm up near Boxborough, Massachusetts. And um, he did, this is him, and he did all that stuff with uh, the Egyptian government and testing uh, at the Sphinx and the, and the pyramids and all that. Um, he died unexpectedly. And when, when he died, his daughter took over the foundation and he, uh, they didn't have any use for it and we ended up with it. So I'm, I have these two uh, GPR units I'm very willing to um, give to people. Remember, I started this from the very selfishness of myself I, that I was talking about. So we need some help with this fort, right? Anybody wants to come help GPRs, you can borrow them anytime you want. Just I need some help. All right. Now, switching to another story. I put out my stories, I give my classes all through the area, and in comes the Wirge family. So the Wirge family uh, is in Thompson, Connecticut. Uh, Carolyn Wirge has passed, her husband Bob still lives. And uh, David Wagner and I went out to the Wirge car and field with some other folks who were nearer folks. And, men, and some of you here may have gone with me. Certainly Matt has been. 
So we're out there, and David Wagner, he's coming up with his art. And afterwards, the Wurge Carnfield, uh, they wanted to do something to preserve it, and it's a beautiful site. And Thompson, Thompson has well over 1,200 documented carns in several large fields, 300 plus carns in, in uh, three fields, and then some spot carns around. So they've, uh, they've turned this uh, site over to the historical society with a preservation easement, and I give tours there uh, twice a year. So anytime you want to go, we'd, we'll try to go. I usually go between um, November, the end of November and 1st of March is what we go. So this just, just shows these alignments. There's certain alignments on the site on our cliff edge, and these have been here a long time. Uh, we have our, our group has uh, a PBS movie running now in, uh, in Maine. It's played in, in, it's a localized PBS, so it's played throughout New England. But we're doing or planning a PBS film on this site and the Fort Hill, uh, search for the Fort Hill cellar. So we're, we're looking for help. So anyway, stay tuned. Uh, we're trying to protect our 800 year old sweat hut. That's our next story, which is we're going to try to do another conservation easement. Anyway, that's it. I uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs>